Honorable Honorable Abbasinda Rachel Umamo, our Cabinet Secretary, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Kenya, Mr. Yoshiki Takeuchi, the Deputy Secretary General for OECD, Ms. Maria Hosegarde, Chair of the Global Forum, Abbasinda Francis Modaura, the Chair of the KRI Board of Directors, Kenya Revenue Authority, Ms. Grace Perez Navarro, Deputy Director, Center for Tax Policy and Administration, that is the OECD. Ms. Zaida Manata, Head of the Secretariat of the Group of Forum. Of the Africa Initiative and the Commissioner for South Africa Revenue Service. General and Directors General, of various tax administrations present here, our distinguished guests, that I welcome you to Nairobi, Kenya, for the 11th meeting of the Africa Initiative, the first in person meeting since we last met in Paris, France, on the seventh meeting and the fifth anniversary of the Africa Initiative in November 2019. The Africa Initiative was launched in 2014 by the Global Forum on Transparency and Exchange of Information for Tax Purposes. Its African member countries and some key partners to unlock the potential of tax transparency and tax exchange of information for African countries and ensure that they are well equipped to benefit from it. To date, 33 African countries participate in the initiative, which aims at enhancing the use of the improved global tax transparency to tackle tax evasion and collect more tax revenues for Africa. Initially set up for a period of three years, that is 2015 to 2017, the Africa Initiative was renewed for a second phase, that is 2018 to 2020, in November 2017, and recently for a third phase, 2021-2023, at its eighth meeting held on 29th of September to, to 2nd of October 2020. two strategic axes of the need to raise political attention to support the implementation of tax transparency and exchange of information standards, and the need to address the administrative and technical capacities, uh, capacities constraints of African tax administrations. Political support is key to combating illicit financial flows using tax transparency and exchange of, 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 inf of information. Decision makers understanding of the effectiveness of tax transparency in the fight against tax evasion and other illicit financial flows is for African countries to benefit from international exchange of information. In addition to ensuring adequate political support, African countries need to establish appropriate infrastructure to implement and benefit from the international exchange of information standards. Members of the Africa Initiative meet every year to take stock of the progress made in this agenda and to discuss the remaining challenges. By the Global Forum, the Africa Union Commission, and the African Tax Administrative Forum. This is the 11th meeting. Nous sommes à la 11e réunion de l'initiative Afrique et nous sommes heureux de pouvoir lancer aujourd'hui la quatrième édition du rapport sur la transparence fiscale en Afrique. Findings will soon be presented by Ms. Zaida Manata, 
head of the Global Forum Secretariat. I am sure that we will agree or that African countries have achieved tremendous progress since the launch of the Africa Initiative in 2014. In November 2017, Cameroon hosted a high level meeting of Africa, African finance ministers and heads of tax administrations on the margins of the plenary of the meeting of the Global Forum. Participants to this meeting recognized that while the global landscape for fighting tax evasion and avoidance had changed, African countries were not yet fully exploiting the advances in international cooperation in the mobilization of their domestic revenues. They adopted the Yaounde Declaration, which marked an important step in and combat illicit financial flows in Africa. This evening, or this morning, my peers, heads of tax administrations of African countries will join me to celebrate the fifth anniversary of the Yaounde Declaration and discuss the, the next steps in leveraging tax transparency and exchange of information to combat tax evasion and other illicit financial flows in Africa. The work of the African Initiative would not be possible without the synergy with other key players. Today, Tax Administra Administration Forum, the African Union Commission, the Saco de Reflexion Health Exchange Desk, a very complicated word there, but let me call it CREDAF, the European Union, Administration Forum, the World Bank and the World, and the World Bank Group. We would like to thank all the partners and donors of the African Initiative for their support in the tax transparency and exchange of information agenda in Africa. I am also pleased to welcome the International Finance Corporation, IFC, and the Commonwealth Association of Tax Administrators, CATA, who joined these, four, these 14 partner institutions and donors in supporting the African Initiative in 2022. Countries' participation in the tax transparency and, 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 and translate the, the global improvements in this area in additional revenues for our development. to seize this opportunity to thank them for their participation, which I hope will provide them with a better understanding which I, uh, of the importance of tax transparency and exchange of information for domestic resource mobilization strategies. I thank you for joining us and wish you all fruitful discussions in further advancing the fight against tax evasion and other illicit financial flows in Africa through enhanced tax transparency and international exchange of information. It is now my pleasure to welcome Ms. Maria Jose Galde, Chair of the Global Forum, the Secretary of the Global Forum to deliver her welcome remarks. Unfortunately, she could not join us in person, but I am, uh, I, I am sure her heart is with us as she has always been a strong supporter of our work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Gidi and Buru, Chair of the Africa Initiative and Commissioner General of Kenya Revenue Authority. Good morning and thank you very much for your kind welcoming remark. Uh, as you say, uh, my heart is with you, uh, as you as you know, and as well for Kenya's hospitality. Thank you as the host of this 11th meeting of the Africa Initiative. To start off, uh, I will also want to greet with immense pleasure, uh, Mr. Josiki Takeuchi, Deputy General, Deputy Secretary General from the OECD, 
Honorable Ambassador Fuku Kanakot Katyatani, Cabinet Secretary National Treasury in Planning. Ambassador Francis Mutaura, Chair of Kenya Revenue Authority Board. Dr. Julius Muia, Principal Secretary, the National Treasury and Planning. Ms. Grace Perez Navarro, Deputy Director of the Center of Tax Policy and Administration. Ms. Saida Manata, Head of the Global Forum Secretariat. And Mr. Edward Kiswetter, Vice Chair of the Africa Initiative and Commissioner of the South Africa Revenue Service the Commissioner General and Director General of Tax Administration. Good morning, dear members, partners, donors, and participants to the Africa Initiative, members of the press and the public in general. I take this opportunity to heartily welcome you all to this 11th meeting of the Africa Initiative, which is a milestone for us all this year. Well, complications related to my schedule has not allowed me to be with you in person in Kenya. I joined you virtually while celebrating the opportunity that this year we have been fortunate to enjoy to a face-to-face -face meeting since the last in-person meeting held in Paris in November 2019. Indeed, today we are gathered to discuss an initiative of the utmost importance, the regional commitment in Africa, also called the Africa Initiative. It was launched uh, at the Global Forum uh, Plenary Meeting in 2014 as a partnership between the Global Forum, uh, its Africa members, currently 33 members, as well as donors and partners. The Africa Initiative encourages the engagement and participation of African countries in international tax cooperation to promote tax transparency and fight not only tax evasion, but also other illicit financial flows. These steps are important as they ultimately result into more resources for development in the region. The Africa Initiative was the, the Global Forum's first regional program. Its results uh, now made visible through the Tax Transparency in Africa report, the fourth edition of which will be launched this morning, resonate beyond the African continent and have inspired the creation of three other regional initiatives by the Global Forum, the Punta del Este Declaration for Latin America, the Passive Initiative, and more recently, the Asia Initiative. The decision taken by members of the Africa Initiative to appoint two senior officials of African countries as chair and vice chair of the initiative in 2020 was a turning point in the direction of this program. This has been critical for the significant progress achieved around the two strategic axes of the Africa Initiative, raising the political attention and building capacities in tax transparency and exchange of information standards for Africa. And we shall hear this over the course of the next three days. I would like to thank Mr. Giti Memburu, as well as Mr. Edward Kiswetter for their leadership of the Africa Initiative. I also applaud the 33 African finance ministers in the African Union Commission who have signed the Yaoundé Declaration, calling for a tax transparency program for Africa and for closer collaboration between countries, sub-regions, and continental institutions to curve IF, uh, in IFFs and enhance DRM, DRM on the continent through enhanced task cooperation. I am convinced that your efforts and valuable contribution will make this a very fruitful meeting to continue promoting regional cooperation and in particular, the exchange of information for tax purpose, purposes in Africa. While I will not be with you in person for one-to-one -one discussions of the coffee breaks, I wish you all very productive discussions aimed to enhance tax transparency and international exchange of information for the Africa region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Maria Jose Garde. 
um, let's appreciate her one more time. She's listening to us, she can see us. And let's give her a nice wave. I think there's a camera that can get you. And thank you very much. We really miss your presence, but we appreciate that you could take time to be with us. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my humble duty to welcome, to give uh, his opening remarks, Mr. Yoshiki Tekeuchi. He is the Deputy Secretary General of the OECD. Welcome, sir. Um, Cabinet Secretary of Foreign Affairs. Monsieur, Madame, Monsieur le Ministre des Affaires étrangères, Ambassadeur, Président de l'Initiative. Uh, Chair of Revenue Authority Board, Ambassador Francis uh, Mutalao. Uh, Chair of Government, um, Ms. Uh, Maria Jose Gaudet. Dear Commissioners, Gen dear Commissioners General and Directors General of Tax Administrations, dear OECD colleagues, dear tax officials, ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to address you today on the occasion of the 11th meeting of African Initiative. First of all, I would like to thank the Kenyan authorities for their warm welcome and hospitality, which remind us the importance of being able to meet again in person. As highlighted by the chair of the African Initiative, Mr. Gilti Mugulu, this important initiative was launched in 2014 by the Global Forum and its key partners. It was launched with the objective of helping African countries to realize the full potential of progress made by the global community to improve tax transparency and to strengthen international tax cooperation. Eight years later, the Trump and this progress made in Africa on tax transparency agenda are visible. When the African initiative was launched, we had 17 African countries Members of the countries, members of the Global Forum. Since then, its membership has doubled, with now 33 African countries participating in this work. The network of exchange of information partners of Af for African countries has expanded from 900 relationships to over 3,500 relationships, with more African countries joining the Convention on Mutual Administrative Assistance in Tax Matters. This convention was created by the OECD and the Council of Europe in 1988 and amended in 2010 to be open to non-OECD and non-Council of Europe members countries. It is the most comprehensive multilateral instrument available for all forms of tax cooperation to tackle tax evasion and avoidance with already more than 140 participant countries. The number of requests of information sent to foreign jurisdiction by African countries to support their cross-border investigation and audits has increased 12-fold, from about 30 requests in 2014 to more than 450 requests. Most importantly, in 2020, for the first time, African countries sent more requests than they received. More Af African countries are joining in the implementation of the standard on automatic exchange of information on financial accounts. All these progress are now translating into revenue gains. The offshore tax investigations supported by the exchange of information on voluntary disclosure programs have enabled African countries to identify over 1 billion in euro. This is a great success for Africa. Dear colleagues, the Africa Initiative is changing the tax transparency landscape, as well as the fight against tax evasion and other illicit financial flows in Africa. I welcome the 2021 progress, which will be highlighted in the 2022 edition of the Tax Transparency in Africa report to be launched this morning. It is encouraging to see many delegates, including senior representatives from Minister of Finance, Tax Administrations, the Continental Organizations, and Civil Society Organizations from across, Af from across Africa gathered here in Nairobi this week. The OECD 
uh, has always played a leading role in the promotion of strong, global, and effective responses to the issue of the tax evasion and illicit financial flows, which deprives us, our governments, from the much needed resources for development. The two internationally agreed standards of transparency and exchangeable information monitored by the global fora are adhered to by over 160 jurisdictions, which work together on equal footing with the Secretary Yard hosted by the OECD. Nearly 100 jurisdictions also participate in the automatic exchange of country by country reports and exchange of tax ruling as part of the base illusion profit and profit theory, BEPS uh, minimum standards. The OECD has always, always been supportive of Africa initiatives since the inception. The launch in 2014 was marked by a high level breakfast hosted by the OECD Secretary General for the heads of Af African delegation including ministers of finance. In 2019, the Secretary General also hosted a high level dinner of African ministers of finance and heads of tax administration to celebrate the fifth anniversary of the Africa Initiative on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of the Global Forum in Paris. Ladies and gentlemen, as we meet in Nairobi this week to celebrate the success of our Africa Initiative, we should also recognize that the progress remains uneven on the continent, and we need more and stronger efforts to close the remaining gaps. The role of the policy and decision makers is crucial to advance the tra tax transparency agenda. If we want to continue to make progress and even more, move faster, African countries have to lead, set the agenda, commit the resources, support your tax administration, administration and unlock the potential uh, this tool provides. Implementing transparency and exchange of information brings some costs, but they are minimal compared to the benefits. They are the engines of the domestic resource mobilization. I applaud the success of the Aounde Declaration, the call to action by already 33 ministers of finance to strengthen the international tax cooperation to combat illicit financial flows in Africa. Our special thanks goes to the growing number of partner organizations and donors of African initiative, including the latest members of the observers, Algeria, the West African Tax Administration Forum, and the International Finance Corporation, who joined us recently. I also thank the members of African initiative for their commitment, the chair and the vice chair for the leadership and the Global Forum Secretariat for its capacity building program, which fuels our collective progress on tax transparency on this continent. And I call non-members to join the Global Forum and African Initiative and benefit from the improved tax transparency landscape to increase their domestic resources. Last week, I wish you all a fruitful meeting and impact, impactful deliberations. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Takeuchi. We really appreciate your remarks. Esteemed ladies and gentlemen, I now would like to take this humble duty to welcome the board of the Kenya Revenue Authority, Ambassador Francis Modara, to come and give his welcome remarks. Thereafter, he's going to welcome onto stage our chief guest, who is Madame Rachel Umamo, our cabinet secretary for foreign affairs right here in Kenya. Welcome very much, Dr. Tari and congratulations on your doctorate, Karibu. Thank you very much. The Honorable Ambassador Richo Omamu, uh, Cabinet Secretary for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Kenya, Mr. James Idimburu, Chairman of this conference and the Director General of the Kenya Revenue Authority, Mr. Yashiki Takeuchi, Deputy Secretary General, OECD, Ms. Maria Jose Gade, 
Chair of the Grupo Forum, Ms. Grace Perez Navarro, Deputy Director, Center for Tax Policy and Administration, OECD, Ms. Zaida Manata, Head of the Secretariat of the Grupo Forum, Mr. Edward Chiweta, Vice Chair of the Africa Initiative and the Commissioner of the South African Revenue Service, Commissioners General and Director General of Tax Administrations, ladies and gentlemen. KRI recognizes the role of tax transparency in achieving its mandate of domestic revenue mobilization. The benefits of the authority has continued to gain from the improved transparency environment cannot be overemphasized. As a tax administration, we shall continue to collaborate with the OECD and the Africa Initiative in promoting global best tax practices in the tax administration. We believe that utilization of a change of information standards and the tools will go a long way in ensuring enhanced revenue mobilization translating to the much needed economic transformation of our countries and the continent. We are therefore honored to host this important event and look forward to fruitful engagements. We call upon you to take time out of your busy schedules to experience culture and the friendship, as well as the flora and the fauna of our beautiful country. It is now my honor and the duty to invite the Honorable Ambassador Rachel Mamu the cabinet secretary for the Minister of Foreign Affairs to deliver the keynote address and to officially open the 11th Africa Initiative meeting. Thank you. Mr. Gidi Mburu, the chair of the Africa Initiative, Mr. Yoshiki Takauchi, the deputy secretary general OECD, Ms. Maria Jose Grande, chair of the Global Forum, Ambassador Francis Muzaura, chair of the board of directors of the Kenya Revenue Authority, Ms. Grace Perez Navarro, Deputy Director, Center for Tax Policy and Administration at the OECD. Ms. Zaida Manata, Head of the Secretariat of the Global Forum. And Mr. Edward Kaivester, Vice Chair of the Africa Initiative and Commissioner of the South African Revenue Service. Commissioners General, Director Generals of Tax Administrations, ladies and gentlemen. May I echo the sentiments of those who have come before me and welcome you heartily to Nairobi. Unfortunately, you're coming to Nairobi during our cold season. I want to assure you that it's usually very warm here, uh, but you come uh, to receive the warm hospitality of Kenyans. We're delighted to receive you and for you to be part of us during the next few days. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be part of this important event that brings together key stakeholders to take stock of the journey of the Africa Initiative 
since its launch in 2014. Being a regular meeting, this meeting provides a useful forum for reflecting on gains made from the improved transparency on tax matters in Africa, as well as strategies for addressing challenges that prevent African countries from drawing maximum benefit from the improved transparency environment. Significant too is the fact that the wide range of stakeholders participating in this meeting have an opportunity to share useful experiences on pertinent issues that will enable Africa make progress in tackling tax avoidance and evasion. Your attendance is therefore much appreciated. And I take this opportunity to recognize your important presence and the value of this conference to Kenya. African countries face a myriad of challenges related to illicit financial flows and tax evasion. These challenges are persistent. They cut across borders and account for colossal sums of money transferred out of our countries illegally. This strips African countries of resources that could be used to finance much needed public goods and services such as health, education, security, and infrastructure, and to reduce the burden of debt that is shouldered across the continent. As you may be aware, the Economic Development in Africa report for 2021 estimates that Africa loses about $88.6 billion. That is about 3.7% of its gross domestic product annually in illicit financial flows. In the case of Kenya, reports by Africa Tax Justice Network Africa, Oxfam, and the Global Financial Integrity show that we could be losing close to Kenya shillings 500 billion which is equivalent to 43 billion US dollars every year in illicit financial flows. Indeed, Kenya annually loses billions of shillings in taxes to shrewd traders who falsify the value of goods and services. It is for these reasons that jurisdictions need to collaborate, especially by sharing critical information that would enable tax administrations seal the loopholes created by these schemes. Ladies and gentlemen, currently Kenya has various instruments to facilitate exchange of information, including tax information exchange agreements, double taxation agreements, and most importantly, the Multilateral Convention on Mutual Administrative Assistance in Tax Matters, which came into force in Kenya in January 2021. The MAC enables Kenya to exchange information for tax purposes with over 130 jurisdictions. I know that African countries, which are signatories, signatories to the MAC, have a large network of EOI partners compared to those who are entirely reliant on bilateral agreements. I therefore call upon those African countries that have not signed and ratified the MAC to do so, to enable them realize the benefits of the global transparency environment. Ladies and gentlemen, in 2019, Kenya also signed the Yaoundé Declaration to curb illicit financial flows. This partnership has improved international tax cooperation through enhanced information sharing amongst the African Union members to eliminate illicit financial flows. The Yaoundé Declaration has additionally encouraged African countries to explore partnerships with the African Union, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, 
regional economic communities, and the African Development Bank to boost efforts towards the implementation of tax transparency standards and the EOI tools. The, the declaration has so far been endorsed by 33 African countries and the AU Commission. I encourage African countries that have not endorsed this instrument to do so to demonstrate commitment to transparency in tax matters. Ladies and gentlemen, the exchange of information for tax purposes goes a step further to provide for other tools, including automatic exchange of information, tax examinations abroad, simultaneous tax examinations and assistance in tax collection. These tools will continue to enhance the capacity of tax administrations in Africa in domestic revenue mobilization and ultimately in the required transformation of our continent. I call upon all countries to fully support these initiatives, which will go a long way in supporting the development of our countries. I am glad to note that Kenya is the current chair of the Africa Initiative. Kenya continues to affirm its support for the Global Forum and the Africa Initiative. Our country is committed to the process of enhanced transparency. Ladies and gentlemen, during this forum, we are going to witness the launch of the Tax Transparency in Africa 2022 Africa Initiative Progress Report. The report will give valuable insights into the steps that African countries have, have made in utilizing exchange of information to address tax evasion and illicit financial flows. The expectation is that the report will demonstrate the commitment and the determination of African countries in progressing the tax transparency agenda through enhanced exchange of information, as well as the benefits that have accrued from the utilization of tools that have been made available in support of the tax transparency agenda. It is also my expectation that this report will highlight some of the challenges that we will need to continue to address to further improve this tax transparency environment. Ladies and gentlemen, in closing, allow me uh, to thank the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, for their partnership that has given African countries the opportunity to share and to adopt global best tax practices. I also wish to extend my gratitude to all our partners who have been instrumental in supporting Africa initiative programs, including in enhancing capacities of our tax administrations. And with those remarks, I now declare the 11th Africa Initiative meeting officially open. And I thank you for your kind attention. I think Madame Rachel requires and deserves another round of applause. Thank you so much, Madam Rachel, for joining us today and officially opening the 11th Africa Initiative meeting. We understand that she has another uh, meeting that she has to rush to, so we appreciate that you really came to join us today. Please take our greetings to the ministry as well. And thank you as well to our speakers today for your addresses to the delegates today. We appreciate you. And just to let you know that we also have an online community joining us online and they are also um, having conversation as well online. It is now my humble duty to give back the meeting to our chairman who is Mr. Gedim Boro of the African Initiative. Okay, so there is the online community. Thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate you. So allow me now, ladies and gentlemen, as team's delegates to welcome back to stage our chairman of the African Initiative, Mr. Gedim Boro. Mr. Gedi, Karibu Sana.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wageni. And uh, let me also take this opportunity to thank our CS for being available for us and all the speakers who have been able to present or make their opening remarks. We will now move to the next session where we will uh, have a presentation on the on the report that we are go that we are going to launch today and i would like to invite zaida to make that presentation thank you chair and a good morning to all of you uh, first let me start by thanking kenya for the warm welcome that we have all received here. It's our great pleasure to be in Kenya and uh, enjoy this beauty country and uh, uh, this uh, warm people that have uh, provided a proof of their hospitality uh, yesterday evening with a wonderful welcome cocktail where we could uh, uh, greet each other, dance, enjoy the wonderful food and just have uh, fun with friends. Uh, so thank you very much, Kenya, um, Asante Sana. So um, I have the pleasure today to um, in, to present to you the um, the progress that African countries have been making and that they made in the 2021 uh, in the scope of the uh, Africa Initiative. So uh, this report uh, um, presents the uh, main uh, findings and uh, the takeaways uh, from what we saw uh, happening in Africa last year. We have uh, uh, 38 countries um, providing their inputs to our, our survey. So it means that we had more countries that are members of the Africa Initiative that participate in the survey. And this is very important for us because it demonstrates the importance of this, uh, um, this report and how it reflects the progress that African countries are making and the scope of uh, transparency and exchange of information. So uh, I don't know if I have the... Um, the, the, the to change the slides or if someone's gonna help me. Can we move to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so um, as has been highlighted by uh, the uh, opening remarks of several uh, speakers, we can see that African countries, they suffer great losses from illicit financial flows. Um, reports have been uh, estimating this upward trajectory of illicit financial flows from Africa and uh, the negative impact uh, on the continent. So they are estimated between 50 and 80 billion of US dollars every year. And uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, these illicit financial flows, they have a, a very negative impact on, uh, on the development of Africa. So uh, from the pre-COVID uh, estimations, um, the Africa's um, sustainable development goals gap was estimated at around 20 billion of dollars every year. And uh, 2021 studies estimated that this gap has even uh, um, increased between 50 and 70%. It means that uh, uh, this, uh, the challenge has become even um, bigger. So, um, Ensuring uh, the economic recovery of, uh, of Africa um, has been highlighted by the African Union Commission. And they are forecasting that uh, the share of uh, the world GDP is expected from African countries is expected to be at its lowest level since 22. So COVID has pushed at least an additional 29 million of people into extreme poverty. So effectively curbing illicit financial flows would unlock the much needed resource in Africa. But at the end of the day, what are we talking? We talk about illicit financial flows. What are we talking about? We are talking about uh, um, any cross-border uh, financial transfer that contravene domestic or international laws, uh, agreements, and tax evasion is a very important part of these flows. So the link between tax transparency and illicit financial flows is supported by research. Doc it's, 
fully documented. But where transparency is, uh, is uh, not present and the certainty uh, is high, so the rate of illicit financial flows is higher. Uh, because increasing transparency and exchange of information uh, provides a light to these flows and allows uh, the authorities to really uh, curb this, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, very negative uh, uh, flows that uh, goes out of, uh, of African countries. So um, deterring um, tax evasion and other illicit financial flows can have a very positive impact to African development and to the quality of life of African people. So this is part of the, uh, of, uh, the strategy to achieve the agenda 2063 of uh, the Africa we want. That's uh, part of, uh, of uh, uh, this uh, agenda and a, a strategy to uh, reach these goals. Next slide, please. So um, considering all these facts and circumstances, the Africa Initiative was launched in 2014. And the goal was to uh, partner um, the Global Forum, partners, um, African countries, and the international organization and development partners to unlock the potential of transparency and exchange of information to uh, fight against uh, these illicit financial flows and especially tax evasion. The issue was quite evident. Um, while the past decade had shown um, extreme progress in the area of transparency around the globe, African countries were not benefiting fully from it. Um, and so they were not using at the same extent at, as other countries, these tools that were available. And uh, so it was clear that African countries had to be helped, had to be encouraged to uh, exploit the uh, improvements in the area of uh, global transparency to better tackle tax evasion. And that working together, African countries to reach that, uh, that goal. So focusing on Africa would enable uh, the identification of a specific approach and the provision of tailored support to address the specific needs and priorities of African countries. So uh, the Africa Initiative has grown uh, over the years and has contributed to share transparency and exchange of information agenda across the continent. Um, today, the Africa Initiative is a strong partnership of Global Forum, 33 African members, 16 regional and international organizations and development partners, which include the African Union Commission, the ATAF, the African Development Bank, um, CREDAF, WATAF, and others. And we have the pleasure to um, welcome also new partner organizations, the, the IFC and CATA. So um, in uh, um, 2020, in 2020, uh, the mandate of the Africa Initiative was renewed by another three years, 2021 to 2023. And uh, at that moment, uh, um, the African members agreed that a more active role should be played by African countries. They should take the leadership of this initiative. And uh, it was uh, with this goal uh, that uh, uh, we had a new governance in place. And for the first time, the Africa Initiative um, selected a chair, elected a chair, and uh, we were very pleased to have uh, Mr. Buru, the Commission General of the Kenya Revenue Authority, and uh, Mr. Edward Kiswetter, the Commission General of the South African Revenue Services, as the chair and vice chair of the initiative um, in 2021. So, as countries recognize the progress achieved under their leadership, they um, agreed to extend their mandates for another year. So their mandate was extended to 2022 as well. Next slide, please. So uh, the rationale of, uh, of the uh, Africa Initiative is based on two uh, strategic axes. One is uh, the increasing uh, political awareness and, uh, uh, and commitment in Africa. And this is done to high level engagement, working with uh, African institutions, uh, promoting the Young Dead Declaration that is a call for actions um, uh, promoted by uh, finance ministers of African countries and a meeting with uh, decision makers, um, meaning um, ministers of finance, uh, uh, congressmen, senior officials to, uh, to uh, uh, raise awareness and promote transparency. 
The other axis is uh, the development of capacities in African countries. And this is done through the strengthening of the legal framework to ensure the availability and the access to uh, information that is relevant for tax purpose, improving the organization of the uh, tax administration and the setting up of uh, exchange of information unit. Uh, this is really important because they are the ones who will be running the, the, uh, running the exchanges, running the operational aspects of it, and that they have the appropriate tools. They have manuals, they can track the information um, and the requests for it. And also training the officials and training the officials not only to uh, perform the exchange of information, but also to make use of it, which means uh, training um, tax auditors and tax investigators to make use of exchange of information and uh, so that they can uh, um, uh, benefit from these, uh, these tools. Um, Maybe a uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the Africa Initiative, uh, the annual report uh, uh, that is, is going to be launched soon, is uh, it measures the progress made by African countries uh, during the year, which means 2021. This report is the fourth edition of this uh, of this kind, and uh, um, we have uh, 38, as I mentioned, African um, jurisdictions contributing, and this is the highest number. Uh, since the publication of the first edition report in 2019. It includes a feedback from six countries that did not participate in last year's surveys, um, but does not contain feedback from true countries that had participated in last year. So, and they didn't participate in uh, 2021. So um, this uh, report has become a barometer of the tax transparency development in the continent and a compass for further actions to join the progress, the tax transparency agenda. So I would uh, um, ask you to uh, allow me to delve into the findings of this report in, uh, in uh, um, 2021. No, move back to the last slide, please. So um, as an outcome of the increased political awareness uh, that I, I was just mentioning before, um, we, have, uh, we, we would like to highlight that first Algeria became the 33rd African member of the, uh, of the Global Forum and the Africa Initiative. And it's uh, with uh, a lot of pleasure that I welcome uh, Algeria to, to the Global Forum and to the Africa Initiative. And uh, the increasing support to the Young Day Declaration uh, was, uh, was demonstrated by the endorsement of uh, Rwanda and Algeria and uh, Botswana endorsed it this year. So it's not in the report, but Botswana has also endorsed the uh, Yaoundé Declaration in 2022. And now we have the declaration supported by 33 may, uh, countries and the African Union Commission, which have added their way to this call to the fight against illicit financial flows and tax evasion. We hope that uh, more African countries will join us in this journey. So um, next slide, please. Um, delve into the details now on, uh, on the uh, more technical side. Um, the level of uh, knowledge on uh, exchange of information has risen sharply. Um, in 2014, uh, the level of uh, knowledge was uh, recognized as low by 78% of the countries. And now only 21% uh, consider low their level of exchange of information. Expertise has progressed. And uh, now we have 79% uh, of the countries rating their level, uh, their, their, their level of uh, um, expertise on exchange of information as medium or, as, or high. And it compares to 23 in uh, 2014. So next slide, please. Um, the other outcomes are also very meaningful. First, uh, um, African countries are building the infrastructure needed to effectively use exchange of information. So the trend is positive across the board as indicated by this, the figure that you can see. Um, in 2021, we had one more country delegating the function of competent authority from the Minister of Finance or head of uh, the tax administration um, to uh, a more operational officer to uh, make the exchange of information process more efficient. 
the, the implementation of dedicated units uh, to exchange of information has increased to 30 in 2021. And this is instrumental to the management of exchange of information on a daily basis. The use of uh, uh, an exchange of information manual and the track it system continue to uh, grow. We have one more additional country adopting an exchange of information manual in two other countries implementing the tracking systems uh, to uh, exchange of information requests. These tools are essential for a well-functioning exchange of information units. So uh, next slide, please. Um, another objective of the Africa Initiative is to help um, the, the broaden of uh, exchange of information network so that uh, uh, a country can request information from more partners. Uh, if you don't have access to information, it's very difficult to really um, perform an audit and identify the amount of tax that is due if a transaction is a cross-border transaction. So it's very important to have a, a, a wide uh, network of exchange of information partners. So we have uh, been a, a very positive trend for the 38 uh, African jurisdictions that were surveyed. Uh, despite the COVID pandemic and the constraint that it has brought to uh, many countries, 383 uh, new exchange of information relationships were created at this as at December 2021. And this was done mainly to the signing of the MAC, the Multilateral Convention on Administrative Assistance and Tax Matters. This is the most powerful instrument for administrative cooperation between tax administrations. And Rwanda signed the MEC in 2021, and Botswana, Eswatini, and Liberia ratified it bringing it into force. And most recently in 2022, Mauritania deposited its instrument of ratification and other African countries are in the process of doing the same. So we are very pleased to see this trend in this slide. Next slide, please. And um, more and more tax administrations are using um, exchange of information tools to make requests. And uh, which means that they are access information that is held abroad. The trend is very positive. Um, in 2014, African countries were not using exchange of information in their tax audits. Uh, you can see that in 2014, we had uh, uh, less than 50 requests made by African countries during the year. So African countries committed in 2014 to use exchange of information networks and by training their tax auditors so they would be aware of this possibility and also to be trained how to make this request, what was required to be successful when we request information from a partner. In 2021, the number of outgoing requests sent by African countries increased by 26% compared to 2020. In addition, the number of countries making requests has also uh, rose to 15 um, compared to 13 in 2020. But as I mentioned these numbers, you might be asking yourselves, um, what is happening? We have only 15 countries making requests. Yes, this is the challenge that we, we face. Um, only four countries accounted for 92% of all the requests sent by African countries in 2021. We have Kenya requesting 45% of all these requests, Tunisia requesting 30%, Algeria 11%, and Nigeria 7%. You can see there is still progress to make in the use of exchange of information by uh, African countries, in particular by ensuring that more African countries can make use, frequent use of this important tool. Next slide, please. Um, so usually when a jurisdiction implements transparency and exchange of information standards, they have a goal of ensuring uh, that uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this implement the implementation of these standards, they will translate into revenue. And this is especially the case uh, for developing countries that suffer great losses from illicit financial flows and uh, uh, through, especially through tax evasion. So the request sent to foreign partners by the 38 African jurisdictions that provided data 
to this survey, translated into additional tax revenue at the amount of 37.2 million of uh, euros in 2021. And since 20, uh, 2009, um, exchange of information has enabled African countries to identify more than 1.2 billion of euros in additional revenues. And that uh, um, encompasses uh, revenue, uh, in, uh, revenue um, penalties and uh, tax, tax penalties and uh, interest. Considering that only few um, African countries are really tracking the revenue that is collected or is identified through exchange of information, we can assume that this figure is even bigger. Um, so um, it, it's necessary to support African countries to use this tool and to uh, track the uh, collection of this tax revenue so that they can uh, report the progress they are making in this, uh, in this field as well. Um, I also would like to highlight that uh, the revenue raised as a result of exchange of information highlights that uh, combating tax border tax evasion and avoidance through exchange of information is also one way of raising the additional revenues needed for the post-COVID-19 recovery. Next uh, slide, please. So we have also more uh, countries committing to automatic exchange of information. Automatic exchange of information is a tipping point in the fight against tax evasion. Over 100 jurisdictions are already exchanging every year uh, information on their um, financial account, uh, uh, financial account uh, held abroad by their tax residents. This is, uh, is done on an automatic basis. Um, and these numbers should reach 121 jurisdictions in 2024. But the implementation of this standard is still uh, limited um, and uh, it's at an early stage in Africa. At the beginning, we had only um, three uh, countries starting uh, as the first, uh, at the first moment. We had uh, Mauritius, Seychelles and South Africa starting exchange of information in uh, 2017 and 2018. But the dynamic has changed and now we have more and more African countries implementing or in the process of implementing automatic exchange of information. As of December 2021, we have nine African countries committed to a specific date and uh, now we have both Senegal and Tunisia considering um, an appropriate date for starting automatic exchange of information and Tunisia has committed to implement it by 2024. We expect other African countries to engage in this type of exchanges uh, soon. So uh, to uh, support uh, develop, develop, um, developing countries to implement automatic exchange of information, the Global Forum launched a new strategy for this implementation. And uh, the idea was to unleash the potential of automatic exchange of information, especially for developing countries. A comprehensive and staged support is available for these countries that are interested in automatic exchange of information. And we also delivered a toolkit providing guidance on all aspects of automatic exchange of information implementation. And this was published in 2021. This was followed by a uh, new e-learning course on automatic exchange of information that was launched in March, 2022. And uh, the Africa Initiative uh, partners, we continue to support the African countries that are willing to implement automatic exchange of information and any other, uh, other uh, aspects that I have mentioned before. Next slide, please. So um, upskilling uh, the, um, the officers from African countries uh, is key. And so we have uh, been developing technical assistance and capacity building activities in 2021. So uh, we have uh, um, 32 African countries benefiting from technical assistance program um, and half of it are induction programs, which is a comprehensive uh, technical assistance program offered to all um, global forum members that uh, um, join us after 2016. Uh, or some of other countries, the other half are benefiting from tailored technical assistance uh, program. The African region is a, a key beneficiary of uh, the Global Forum Technical Assistance Program. 38% of all technical assistance uh, provided by the Global Forum was uh, uh, had as a, a, a destinatory African country. And over 
1,500 1, officials attended uh, 12 trainings, and this attendance is more than the one in the whole period of 2015 to 2019. And this was uh, provided because we were uh, offering more and more uh, virtual trainings, which allowed more uh, office officers to attend them. But uh, you can see that there is an upward trend uh, compared to 2020. So uh, we expect this to grow even more in the coming years. We launched another program and I'm very proud to, to mention it, is the Train the Trainer program. Uh, this was launched as a pilot program in 2021 in Africa. And the objective of this program is to create and support a highly skilled network of trainers to localize and multiply the acquired uh, knowledge and the skills domestically. So we had 34 participants from 17 African countries, and uh, this is a nine month program. And uh, this has resulted in 26 local trainings being held in 13 countries. And these trainings were attended by almost 900 officers. So this, uh, um, this uh, very, uh, engaging um, trainers. They are, um, they are planning additional local trainings for this year and the following years, and they will continue to share their experience and collaborate through uh, the new established Train Day Trainer Network. So um, we have also continued this program, and in 2022, we have uh, 28 participants from 13 countries in Africa. Um, in terms of gender balance, uh, more needs to be done in Africa to increase the per percentage of uh, women's participation in the capacity building activities. While in the most regions around the world, we have an average of above 50% of female attendance, in Africa, in, in Africa, the average is around 40%. So despite remaining low, this percentage represents an increase if you compare to the 34% that was the rate for 2020. And under the Africa Initiative, actions will continue to be promoted to ensure inclusivity and equal access to knowledge. We have also two miles, uh, less miles trainings, which are uh, trainings that focus on sensitizing tax auditors and investigators to increase their awareness of the use of this uh, tool, the exchange of information, and how they could do it. So uh, we we had uh, more than 600 participants in 2021. Next slide, please. So um, we developed three new toolkits in 2021. One is a model manual for exchange of information for tax purpose. And this was done in partnership with the World Bank Group and the African Development Bank. And it provides guidance and templates for implementing relevant procedures for all forms of exchange of information, which includes uh, exchange of information on request, spontaneous, joint audits, etc. And it also reflects recent improvements, such as a group requests. Another toolkit is the toolkit on building effective uh, beneficial ownership frameworks. And this was done in partnership uh, with the Inter-American Development Bank. And as you all know, this is a key area, a key uh, concept uh, for uh, transparency and exchange of information. And it's also one of the biggest challenges in the implementation of the exchange of information standards. So this toolkit, I hope it's gonna be very helpful to all the jurisdictions. Finally, we developed a toolkit for the implementation of the standard uh, for automatic exchange of financial account information. And this was uh, uh, done with the financial support of GIZ. Next, uh, next slide, please. Um, so, um, recognizing that uh, cross-border recovery of tax claims is a critical pillar in a jurisdiction revenue strategy, um, the African countries decided to uh, focus on assistance in this, in this field, and uh, um, because this is a particular challenge, not many countries had experience on that, and uh, uh, this is challenging also at the domestic level. So, um, the Africa Initiative members decided to establish a working group to, uh, to work on this, on this uh, field. And now it's running. It's uh, uh, 
very mature group, and we have uh, 23 officials from 12 African countries uh, working in this field. Um, they, this group developed the first note on the trends on cross-border assistance in the recovery of tax claims in Africa. And uh, the recommendations made by this group was that uh, um, to, um, to be able to fully benefit from assistance in cross-border uh, uh, cross uh, assistance in cross-border uh, collection of uh, tax uh, claims, um, the, the countries had to strengthen their domestic tax claims functions. There would, there would also be necessary to develop a strategy for this, uh, for this function, and uh, they should adopt uh, an appropriate international legal base for facilitating the cross-border uh, recovery of tax claims. And this group has been uh, supported by experts from the Belgian, the Belgian tax administration and the da Japanese tax administrations. We are very grateful for these uh, countries that have provided the experts. I think we have Michael over there. Uh, he, yes, and uh, he's gonna presenting later during these uh, days. And we also have a colleague from Japan that is gonna make a presentation remotely and uh, that to demonstrate the support and uh, that we are receiving from these two jurisdictions. <coughs> Next slide, please. Um, so looking ahead and uh, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what uh, we have to do, what we need to continue doing to, uh, to move this agenda forward. So, uh, the, uh, the COVID pandemic has progressively receded in most countries. So we are focusing on promoting the inclusion of exchange of information in national strategies for the uh, for DRM and for the post uh, pandemic recovery. With our partners, we continue to deliver tailored assistance in, the, in line with the needs of each country. Um, we do not adopt a one size fit all approach. We uh, try to understand the reality of each country and help them implement the strategy that they develop themselves. So we support uh, each country in their path towards uh, the implementation of this standard and to the benefits of it. We understand that each country has a different path and a different rhythm. So we want to support each one of you in your uh, path towards a more transparency and the use of exchange of information. The main areas of support that we'll be focusing on are um, an effective exchange of information framework and the broadening of automatic exchange of information implementation. And support will be provided to ensure that uh, countries have a robust domestic framework to comply with the international standards and uh, support their fight against tax evasion and other forms of illicit financial flows. And, uh, to that, uh, to that end, we should also monitor the impact of uh, uh, exchange of information on uh, DRM and on the fight against illicit financial flows. I also uh, am very pleased to say that uh, while the female participation of African officials in the global forum events have, have, it has increased compared to last year, despite it still being um, reduced compared to other regions. But this year, we have another trigger that uh, we hope will increase uh, uh, the participation of uh, the female colleagues in the, in the discussions and the, the events of, uh, related to transparency and exchange of information. We launched this year the program Women's Leaders in Tax Transparency, and uh, the goal is to promote uh, female leadership in tax transparency and uh, so reduce gender gaps. On this uh, 2022 uh, pilot edition, we have uh, eight motivated and brilliant participants from Africa. And this is out of the 22 participants. So Africa is participated with uh, a large share of these, uh, these uh, brilliant ladies that are uh, engaging in this program. Um, we will also, of course, continue to, uh, to uh, work on the uh, area of cross-border assistance in the recovery of, of tax claims. And uh, we hope that this would uh, help countries uh, move forward in this so important function for any tax administration. Next slide, please. So to conclude, I would like to thank with all my heart, all the donors and partners of the Africa Initiative for their commitment and their support. Uh, I don't think, uh, 
it's the next. I don't think we could have done it uh, without their support. And uh, um, the trust that they deposit on us um, motivates us to move even further. So I want to thank uh, especially the European Union, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, Senegal, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. Next slide, please as well as our partners in the Africa Initiative. The Africa Union Commission, ATAF, uh, the African Development Bank, CATA, PREDAF, IFC, WATAF, and the World Bank Group. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I think you will have to join me again in thanking Zaida for a very eloquent an elaborate presentation. We have taken note of the progress made by African countries. It's very evident that Africa is making serious progress in ensuring that there is political support for exchange of information, and also in ensuring that there is capacity in Africa to ensure effective exchange of information. So thank you, Zaida, for that. Now, the role of civil society is clearly recognized as vital in influencing changes in the global tax environment. The Tax Justice Network Africa has been at the forefront of this in Africa. We would like now to have a commentary from, the, from Ms. Chennai Mukuba Policy Research and Advocacy Manager, Tax, Tax Justice Network Africa, on how exactly they see progress, the progress that Africa has made in addressing tax evasion using exchange of information. We'd like to hear what is their view on where we are. So allow me now to welcome Ms. Mukuba to make a few comments. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. First of all, allow me to thank you for, for recognizing the role of civil society and for inviting us to be able to contribute to this discussion. Thank you so much for your presentation, Zeda. Um, I think it very accurately reflected what was in the publication that we received. And I think one of the things that I want to begin by highlighting is that um, the report clearly indicates the importance of the need for African countries to tackle illicit financial flows. And it also speaks to the way in which the promoting of tax transparency and exchange of information are important um, and cannot be understated. And this is particularly given the disruptions we've been seeing within the global economy. And so, to not mention all of them, a couple of these that have particularly negatively affected the continent include the COVID pandemic, which upended economies and health sectors, the climate change issue that we are seeing that is devastating communities across the continent, the conflicts that we are seeing across the world that are as a result causing an increase in commodities, and also the debt burden that many African countries are facing, really pointing to the need that African countries need to double down on finding ways to curb illicit financial flows and promote domestic resource mobilization. And so there's three points that I would like to speak to this morning. Three points that we think could increase the uptake of African countries using tax transparency and exchange of information um, to help them, to borrow your words, Zeda, unlock their potential. So the first point that I'd like to speak to is the way in which as an institution, we view this current tool as fit for purpose. So from the report, we can see that African countries are indeed making strides. We can see an increase in the level of knowledge that tax administrators have. We can see that more countries are essentially putting in place core elements. We can also see that there is a significant amount of revenue that is coming back to the continent. But in our view, we feel that there is a need to somewhat temper our enthusiasm about the progress that's being made. In the last eight years, this is the documentation we saw in the pub publication. We saw 
that progress had been made indeed in tackling tax evasion and other illicit financial flows through transparency and exchange for and exchange of information for tax purposes. The increase of countries, the increase of countries making requests to 15 last year was up from six in 2014, which reflects an increase of about one country per year. And so as, as TGNA, we were requested to look at what are some of the challenges that African countries may be facing in embracing transparency strategies in the fight against tax evasion. African countries face certain challenges. They've indicated that they lack the capacity to collect information locally to allow them full reciprocal information exchange. They lack capacity to analyze the information received as well as deal with information technology. However, not all the challenges are related to insufficient capacity. There are also challenges that we feel are related to the design that beg our attention. So it's important for us to interrogate why has there been somewhat of a slow uptake, given the potential positive implications that this tool can have for African governments, why does it seem as though there is somewhat of a lethargic response? And it's important for us to ask ourselves the difficult questions about how fit for purpose this tool is. In addition to only 15 countries making requests, it's also noted that it's uneven progress that we are seeing. So only four countries accounted for 92% of the requests made by African countries. The report doesn't really delve into this question. It highlights a lot of the steps that are being taken to address the capacity challenges. But what's important to also look into is are there potential design issues that are limiting the way in which African countries are able to and are taking advantage of this opportunity. So with my next two points, I want to delve into the systematic challenges that we also think could be contributing to this. The current automatic exchange of information standard requires reciprocal exchange, i.e. both jurisdictions have to agree to send each other information. However, many non-G20 developing countries are not popular destinations for citizens from developed countries to hide assets but several developed countries are important destinations for citizens from developing countries to hide assets. As a result, as civil society, we have been consistently calling that automatic exchange of information should be shared on a non-reciprocal basis with non-G20 developing countries that are not financial centers, particularly least developed countries. Comparatively, there is a relatively small amount of money that is moving from rich countries to poor countries, yet vast sums of money are moving the other way. Therefore, it makes sense to offer developing countries a grace period somewhat, where they can receive information without sending their own. And this could be for a period of time. This principle of common but differentiated responsibilities is something that we see in many UN negotiations and something that we feel could also be of value in this particular situation. My third point is around contribution to standard setting. If we want to address some of the design standards, it's important that we also discuss, if we also want to, if we want to design standards relevant to developing countries, a design issue that we believe is important is also the one where we see African party, African countries being a part of the standard setting and not just of implementation. In this vein, as civil society, we have been calling for these conversations to be primarily held at the United Nations. And so while we see the value of this particular platform, we see it as one that essentially is a safeguard one that can, ser can serve the purpose of providing a facilitative purpose as it seeks to essentially ultimately create a framework for international cooperation, which we think could happen at the UN. Over the past several years, Global South countries have repeatedly called for the establishment of an international tax body under the auspices of the UN to fix the tax system. Last month, for example, we saw that this call was reiterated by the Conference of African Ministers of Finance, Planning and Economic Development. We see this as particularly valuable 
because we would then see it as a platform where African countries can also contribute to the design and rather than, rather than just the implementation of some of these standards. And so as I conclude, what I'd like to say is that we are indeed seeing progress. We are seeing increased transparency and exchange of information for tax purposes, as has been reported. But we are of the view that much more can be done. We note that African governments see the value of this work. However, there is a need to address not only the internal issues that have been reflected in the report, but some of the systemic and structural issues as well. And as we do so, we hope that as we work towards sealing the gaps that are allowing for the outflow of illicit financial flows from the continent, we see ourselves drawing closer to the attainment of our continent's objectives and goals. Thank you very much. So thank you, uh, Ms. Mukuba, for very insightful uh, comments. I am sure the issues you have raised will inform our deliberations moving forward in this meeting and also in the future engagements within the Global Forum and also within the, Af the uh, Af Africa Initiative, especially the question of sharing information, automatic sharing of information on a reciprocal basis. So thank you very much indeed. We uh, allow me now to also welcome His Excellency, Mr. Albert M. Muchanga, Commissioner for Economic Development, Trade, Industry and Mining Africa Union Commission to give us a few comments uh, through a virtual platform. Mr. Gitmuru, Commissioner General, Kenya Revenue Authority. Mr. Edward Kizweta, Commissioner, South African Revenue Service. Ms. Zaida Manatam, Head of the Global Forum Secretariat. Mr. Logan Watt, Executive Secretary of the African Tax Administration Forum. Commissioners General of the African Tax Administrations, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to address this 11th meeting of the Africa Initiative. While they have wished to be with you in person, it was not possible due to commitments in the 12th World Trade Organization Ministerial Meet Conference, which is now underway in Geneva, Switzerland. I'm, however, pleased to be able to convey the African Union perspective on the 2022 tax transparency in Africa report through this video communication. The tax transparency in Africa report is gaining stature as a source of data on tax transparency and exchange of information. This bodes well for the continent, which is striving to mobilize domestic resources to finance its own sustainable development, productive transformation, and inclusive growth. Combating illicit financial flows, IFFS, continues to be one of the pillars of improving domestic resource mobilization, and tax transparency and exchange of information have proven to be the reliable tools in combating illicit financial flows from Africa. The increasing number of countries that are providing information for the report is evidence of the confidence that our member states place in the TTIA. Six non-member non states in, Africa, in the African Initiative also came forward to submit information to the 2022 report. This is a positive step, and the African Union will continue to encourage more member states to join the African Initiative and contribute to the propagation of the report. Our objective is that all the 55 African Union member states eventually join the Africa Initiative. Countries that are part of the Africa Initiative have received additional tax revenues as a result of the use of requests for information. There are hence clear benefits to be part in being part of the Africa Initiative, and hence the call for each and every African Union member states 
to be part of this initiative so that they enjoy the benefits. I would like to take this opportunity to commend the Global Forum Secretariat, the African Tax Administration Forum, and my team for their efforts in producing the 2022 Tax Transparency in Africa report. I assure you of the continued commitment of the African Union Commission in this partnership. I'll conclude by calling upon member states of the African Union and other stakeholders to make use of this publication and the rich information it contains as we will contribute to curbing illicit financial flows from Africa. I end here and thank each and every one of you for your kind attention. Mr. G. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate the, con the continued support from the Africa Union Commission to the work of the Global Forum and also the work of the Africa Initiative. We are now ready to formally launch the report. And I will ask our moderator again, Wamba, to lead us in that session. Thank you very much, our chair of the African Initiative, Mr. Gedim Boro. Ladies and gentlemen, cometh the hour, cometh the man. And we are now ready to launch the report um, that we have just previously been introduced to. So I would kindly request that our chair of the African Initiative, Mr. Gedim Boro, to please take to the right there where the flags are. And I also want that Madam Zaida Manata to please um, accompany him and Mr. Yoshiki Takeuchi to please go there. The ladies in the beautiful Ankara coats are going to give you a dummy book. Then our chair will officially launch or declare that the report is officially launched. There are the dummy books, ladies and gentlemen, the tax transparency in Africa reports. Our chairman is about to declare that it is officially launched after a fantastic photo moment right there. Great smiles. It's a great report as well. It's the Tax Transparency in Africa 2022 Africa Initiative Progress Report. It is my honor to declare the Tax Transparency in Africa 2022 Africa Initiative Progress Report officially launched. Excellent. A warm round of applause, please. There we go. There we go. Let's keep clapping and appreciate. <laughs> There is the dummy book. That's how the report will be looking like. It is the tax transparency report. There we go. Let's give them another warm round of applause, esteemed delegates. It's the tax transparency in Africa 2022 Africa Initiative Progress Report. Thank you very much, our chairman. Well done to all our partners, to the Global Forum. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mr. Yoshiki. Thank you very much, Ms. Zaida. We appreciate, and there it is, ladies and gentlemen. There is our report. Congratulations. Well done, well done, and thank you very, very much. Another warm round of applause. Excellent, great conversations that we've been having this morning. And of course, to Capital was the launch of the tax transparency report, progress report. I believe we are now settled to go into the next session, which is the high level panel, tax, tax transparency and the fight against illicit financial flows in Africa. I'd like to welcome you back, Mr. Chair to take over this particular session. Carry Thank on. you very much, Wageni. And welcome back, members. I want to believe you had 
uh, a wonderful either cup of tea, water, or coffee, whichever you have uh, enjoyed. We now move to the next uh, session, which is the topic for this session is tax transparency and the fight against illicit financial flows, which is going to be moderated by Mr. Hamza Ali, senior reporter, international tax, Bloomberg. So, and, and I would like now to take this opportunity to welcome Hamza Ali to proceed. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, yeah, thanks um, for inviting me. And um, I'm very excited about this panel. I think it uh, it's full of um, a number of experts who've been sort of leading the way in tax transparency for the last few years. Um, the, fight of, the fight against illicit financial flows is at the forefront of the development agenda. It features as part of um, uh, goal 16 in the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which aims to significantly reduce illicit financial flows and arm flows, strengthening the recovery and return of stolen assets uh, and combat all forms of organized crime by 2030. And it's not just the Sustainable Development Goals, the African Union has equally placed uh, fighting illicit financial flows and strengthening domestic resource mobilization at the top of its agenda, recognizing these as critical to the achievement of the Agenda 20, uh, 2063, the Africa we want. And over the past 30, uh, sorry, over the past decade, uh, there have been several studies that have pointed out the negative impacts of illicit financial flows, flows on Africa's development. Um, and have and these have attempted to measure its scope and size. Uh, it's now well established that the annual loss through various forms of illicit financial flows in Africa is well over 80 billion. Uh, the unprecedented improvements on tax transparency and exchange of information, however, have helped combat some of the tax evasion, have helped combat this and reduced uh, the, and changed the tax evasion landscape and create new opportunities to fight against other forms of illicit financial flows. Um, our first um, intervention today uh, is uh, Ms. Grace Perez Navarro, Deputy Director of the Center of Tax Policy and Administration, uh, where she heads up the Global Forum on Tax Transparency, Exchange of Information, and Exchange of Information for Tax Purposes, uh, commonly referred to as the Global Forum. Um, she also heads up their sort of various tax transparency efforts. Now, uh, since the G20 declared the era of bank secrecy over in 2019, uh, 2009, sorry, uh, the OECD has been at the forefront of the fight against tax evasion. Uh, Grace, uh, can you walk us through what are some of the things that the OECD has helped do to, de to design uh, this, a sound global response to the problems posed by tax evasion and other forms of illicit financial flows? Thank you, Ham. Thank you, Hamza, and good morning. It's not working. I think I can hear you. Um, Hello, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Well, thank you, Hamza, and good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here um, and to have just listen to the great progress that is being made in Africa in implementing uh, the transparency standards. It's really wonderful to see. I have been at the OECD for 25 years and I arrived at the OECD with the, uh, um, the first assignment being write a report to get rid of bank secrecy. And it has taken a long time uh, to get to where we are today. Um, and certainly there is much more to be done uh, to improve the situation in Africa and elsewhere in all countries. But I think we have made real and dramatic progress as we have seen from the figures that Zaida was quoting earlier. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about what other things we are doing because obviously um, the exchange of information both on request and on an automatic basis has been a very big focus of the work since 2009. And uh, we have been helping to push that forward and take it beyond uh, those two things. One of the things that has been mentioned by many of the speakers uh, this morning was the importance of the Convention on Mutual Administrative Assistance in Tax Matters, which over 140 countries have signed. 
Um, that convention, which was originally drafted in the 80s and then was opened up in, uh, I believe, 2010 or 2011 to the world, uh, covers much more than just exchange of information on request or automatic exchange. It also provides for collection assistance, uh, simultaneous audits, all different kinds of cooperation among countries. And I would encourage all of you, and especially within the context of this regional initiative, to consider how you can make the most of that convention, all of its provisions. Um, because there is a lot that can be done with that convention to help uh, improve cooperation and uh, strengthen efforts in the fight against tax evasion and also tax avoidance. Um, in terms of the standards, one of the things that you may have seen that we have done is uh, we worked so hard to get rid of bank secrecy and now we have crypto assets, which initially we were all told were fully traceable. Um, but of course, new technologies have been developed to make crypto assets very hard to follow. And we know that crypto assets are being used in money, money laundering, tax fraud, ta tax evasion, et cetera. And so in March, we issued a public consultation document on new reporting requirements on crypto assets so that we don't let this new form of financial asset uh, become a new form of tax evasion. And so we hope uh, to be able to finalize that standard later this year. And I think that will be important. We need to always try to get ahead of these things. And I can tell you when we first started talking about crypto assets uh, in our task force on tax crimes and other crimes, uh, the initial response was from treasuries, let's let this technology develop and see where it goes. It can be good for the economy. And of course, it can be, but um, we need to also uh, worry about the risks and prevent those risks from happening. And so we are hoping, hoping that that standard will be helpful in uh, preventing the abuse of virtual assets. The other thing that we have been doing that is very important, I think, is not only looking at standards and ensuring their implementation, but also looking at the practical application of standards and improving the fight against tax fraud and evasion and other financial crimes. Now, we know that the Global Forum has an excellent capacity building uh, program in place. Uh, I hope that all of you have benefited from it. Um, but there is more to be done in terms of just thinking about how do we actually go about fighting tax fraud and tax evasion? How do we investigate these cases when they are cross-border, which makes it so difficult? Because of course, the information is not all within your territory. And that's where the exchange of information is important. It's even more important that we get that information quickly, that there is information sent about a potential risk so that countries can really combat these things effectively. And this is why we have done several things. One, we have the 10 global principles on fighting tax crimes. This is a report uh, that we put out a couple of years ago. It has now been turned into an OECD recommendation encouraging all countries to take the information, the 10 principles in the report and to use that for a self-assessment to see how um, each country's tax administration compares uh, with these various standards and to see where there can be improvement. And already we've had, I think, over 27 countries that have undertaken the self-assessment and have reported that information. So I encourage you all to take a look at that to see how you can improve um, your fight against tax crimes. Now, the other thing that we have done is that we established almost 10 years ago, the OECD Academy for financial crime investigation. And that is where I first met your director general here. He was one of our students at the uh, Academy in Austria, one of the early students. And I remember at the graduation ceremony, he said to me, Grace, we need an academy in Kenya. And I'm very happy uh, that we do have an academy of, here in Kenya that is helping to train uh, inspectors in the region on how to better fight financial crimes, um, tax evasion, money laundering, bribery, all those financial crimes, because what we have seen 
in our research and also in the Financial Action Task Force National research is that the majority of money laundering cases end up being started from tax information that is provided to money laundering authorities. So it's really important to have a whole of government approach to look at these issues and not just fixate on your tax silo. You need to be able to cooperate with other parts of government in order to fight these crimes effectively. And so I would encourage you to take advantage of not only the 10 global principles, but also the academy that we have here in Kenya and the academy we have in Austria for the international uh, training. Um, the other thing that we have done is look at other, other factors or actors in uh, tax evasion and tax avoidance. And one of the things that we published last year, which caused quite a stir among the, uh, the legal community was our report on uh, professional enablers and the role that professional enablers in white collar crime. And there we also made some recommendations that maybe weren't uh, you were looking at on how to address the issue of lawyers, accountants, and other professionals who enable the um, commission of tax evasion, tax fraud, and other financial crimes. Um, the other thing that we have done to further this uh, effort is we have the program Tax Inspectors Without Borders. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this program, but it was initially set up to help countries in the audit of primarily uh, transfer pricing or other issues related to multinational enterprises. And that has been very successful. And then we received requests to uh, get assistance on how to fight financial crimes. And so we've gotten a couple of pilots on um, criminal investigation assistance. And the beauty of the Tax Inspectors Without Borders program is that it takes experienced inspectors from one country and puts them in the other country to work side by side with the inspectors in those countries to help them build their capacity working on real cases. Now, what we have seen in the area of uh, criminal investigation is that uh, in some countries, tax administrations don't even have a dedicated criminal investigation unit. And so we've been helping to build those up so that, um, so that that capacity is there. So it's been quite important in looking at the various aspects on how you can actually implement the fight against tax evasion, tax fraud, and other financial crimes more effectively. Because exchange of information is a tool. And first and foremost, I think one of the key objectives of the Africa Initiative is to ensure that you are all making the most of this very valuable tool in the fight against tax evasion. But beyond that, there is a more strategic component, an administrative component, an organizational component. And those are the things that we have been trying to do with these various other initiatives. Um, we do also have, uh, and it hasn't met for a few years due to COVID, uh, what we call the Oslo Dialogue, the Forum on Tax and Crime, which we hope will be held in March of 2023. Um, and that brings together all people interested in fighting tax evasion and other financial crimes. So investigators, prosecutors, anti-money laundering authorities, et cetera. And so we hope that uh, we will see many of you when that is organized. But maybe I'll stop here and uh, we can move to questions or other speakers. Thank you. Um, thank you for that overview, uh, Grace. Um, I'll just ask one more question, uh, which is um, what is sort of um, from an African sort of perspective, uh, the benefits of um, exchange of information? I mean, you touched on a lot of sort of the other stuff that you've done, but can you give some specific um, benefits that African countries can enjoy? The benefits from exchange of information? For African countries specifically, yeah. Yes, well, um, <laughs> I think uh, the, the uh, earlier speakers have uh, highlighted the um, vast amounts of illicit financial flows and a lot of this has to do with tax evasion 
And so the exchange of information has a number of benefits. Um, one, just having the agreements in place acts as a deterrent to those who would otherwise engage in tax evasion by simply parking their money in another country. And so that is the first. So even if you do nothing with the exchange, you'll have that deterrent effect in the beginning. But of course, people will then see if you're not using the exchange of information, if you're not highlighting the fact that you've been able to pursue tax evaders with the use of this instrument, well, then that deterrent effect will disappear. So it's really important to use the information. And we do see a lot of money flowing out of Africa. And so this will be an important way to try and bring that money back, bring the tax compliance uh, back, because after all, you know, voluntary compliance is at the core of tax administration. And if your taxpayers, your citizens feel that not everyone is paying their fair share, that people are getting away with tax evasion, then your overall compliance will go down. And so it's really important, especially in uh, countries uh, of this region, that they ensure that the tax administrations have that trust, that they are doing everything possible to make sure that everyone is paying their fair share. And that will in turn uh, give an uplift to voluntary compliance. Thank you. Um, our next panelist um, is um, um, a, a very experienced in sort of um, exchange of information. Um, Mr. Edward Kisweta is commissioner for South Africa Revenue Service, SARS, uh, and a vice chair of the Africa Initiative. Now, South Africa has been a member of the Global Forum since 2009 and has since then made significant efforts to meet international standards and build up its exchange of information framework. Uh, South Africa has been uh, active in tax transparency initiatives and, and currently is <laughs> Mr. Edward uh, Kiswet is vice chair um, of the Global Forum and a member of uh, the Automatic Exchange uh, Peer Review Group. Um, since 2017, Africa has also exchanged financial account information uh, automatically under the common reporting standards. Um, welcome, Mr. Kisweta. Um, my first question for you is, um, what steps uh, has South Africa taken with regard to the implementation of exchange of information and what has been the impact on the fight against tax evasion and other forms of illicit financial flows in South Africa? Good morning. Uh, moderator, um, fellow panelists, um, and especially the leadership of the OECD and my colleague and brother uh, and uh, fellow Commissioner General, Mr. Gitin Guru and host of this conference, all protocol observed. Uh, firstly, I have to say I am devastated that I cannot be there in person, uh, but thankfully I'm able to participate through this virtual medium. I think it's important, firstly, uh, Chair of the Session Chair, to say that uh, South Africa has been an early adopter and have also um, identified itself to be uh, exemplary and a leader in terms of its commitment to the um, common reporting standards uh, and exchange of information protocol. I think it's important that we recognize um, that this creates an institutional framework uh, that enables the, uh, a global, against the globally recognized framework within a safe, transparent, high integrity uh, platform that should give companies the, uh, the confidence uh, of the exchange of information. Earlier points were made about the reciprocity thereof. I lean to the reciprocity uh, principle, but I hear uh, the point that the earlier speaker made about the difficulty in implementation. So suffice to say that we are extremely committed and, and uh, want to be one of the um, exemplars in this regard. It's also a common cause that the loss of the loss of, of, of tax revenue um, erodes the integrity of, of the African economies um, and uh, undermines the most vulnerable of our brothers and sisters from having a improved uh, um, uh, material conditions and well-being. So our commitment to this 
uh, has to be undisputable and unquestionable. Specifically turning to South Africa, I'd like to make uh, following uh, remarks and there'll be few in, during the questions we can, we can um, elaborate on that. Uh, we've institutionalized uh, the use of data and the working with partnership to the extent that we have expressed it as two of our nine strategic objectives under the uh, strategic intent of voluntary compliance. So it is explicit, our commitment to build a evidence-based and a data-driven operating model that supplies us with information integrity uh, within and across our, Africa, uh, uh, our jurisdiction uh, to assist in risk detection, case selection, uh, automatic case resolution, and the augmentation of, uh, of our investigative and audit activities. Of big data, machine learning algorithms, uh, and AI, we don't um, see any other way forward uh, given a growing number of declarations, more than 20 million a year. We cannot process that manually, and therefore, data uh, and the automatic exchange thereof and the automatic uh, use thereof into our operating model has to be institutionalized. We have also, within, within uh, touching both on our institutional capacity, we have created a dedicated uh, capacity, recognizing that some of these IFF flows take part in uh, syndicated uh, multi-entity activities, unlike a single taxpayer evasion or an avoidance uh, uh, transaction. These are generally deeply institutionalized network. Uh, and sometimes I feel like going to a gunfight with a nail clipper. Um, because they just seem to be so much more powerful than we are. I, I think I want to touch uh, on, on very quickly on, on one or two systemic challenges, and then I'll uh, end with some of the benefits we've seen. I think institution, in, internally, we still have found low matching rates uh, when we do exchange information, specifically on the AOI platform, that requires ongoing uh, collaboration and efforts, and sometimes frustrations with information incompleteness, and that's an ongoing work in progress. And secondly, our institutional change management to adopting this is more than just signing a, an agreement. It is about creating sufficient awareness, but also, also the, the capability and capacity to, to use this. And I have to say, I was surprised at uh, the hard work it requires, uh, and, and we've made that a, a huge focus. Beyond the institution, I think there's a couple of elephants in the room. Uh, and, and, and I was, I was reminded of our environment from the, from the tax justice network. That tax administration is simply overwhelmed. And from our own experience, under-resourced, incorrectly prioritized by government, and struggling with their own institutional capability challenges, how to prioritize. We just have too much work relative to our capability and our resources. And therefore, we have to sometimes prioritize and reprioritize. Those are challenges that are ongoing, but I think it's important that we call it out for what they are. In terms of our benefits, I have to say we are an absolute value. In the syndicated country we have, we have complete experience. Some of that already converted into cash. 
identify 6,000 individuals with economic activity of around $10,000, but they're not ready for tax. So we have begun to work, to work with us, completed about the about those cases, and to cases. Uh, help them to register, to apply, and that way we deal with the money. Um, uh, in terms of our voluntary disclosure program, uh, last year we have seen 275 uh, voluntary disclosed, yielding uh, an average of 49 million US dollars. Um, and uh, 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 so 1059 uh, tax revenue to deal with 50 million in tax dollars. And we've also seen a further 20 million what we call soft, soft disclosure, disclosure because people now realize that we are onto this. Uh, so the benefit I can continue, but it's visible, it's tangible, and I can report to any one of those in the audience who still have questions about committing to this platform. That they need to do so. We need to work together because, because this is one of the things that require a single-minded commitment and unparalleled collaboration among us and between us. Let me pause there uh, and hand over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much uh, for that overview. That was uh, really interesting. Um, I guess one of the um, things that, that sort of keeps coming up when we talk about the DOI and sort of African countries is sort of the difficulty of meeting the standard. Um, what were some of the challenges of South Africa and how did you sort of overcome them? Uh, 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 first, uh, even as an organization, uh, Automatic exchange, and we are still struggling with exchange of information and requests. But I think that's just in institutional inertia and prioritization. Um, on the uh, on the EOR, we have received about 150 odd uh, requests. We have only requested 31 since we've adopted this. On the AAEI, however, we have seen significantly more success. Yes. We have we have had over six million account records since we signed up for to the exchange of information, and that in itself has yielded significant results, as I mentioned before. The challenge I've also mentioned, but let me recap: we still find uh, low matching rates, and we we have to work and get a so where there is a ten-digit um, identification number, the matching rate is almost 100%. Uh, where there is an identity number, uh, the, the matching rate is, is, is a little bit less. Uh, and so the matching rate reduces. Um, and so our gold standard must be to work towards a common identification number across all jurisdictions. Uh, so that's the first. The second is, I don't think my colleagues must underestimate the institutional uh, inertia to one, raise awareness um, to the level of auditors who actually conduct the auditors who are not always aware of these instruments that is available to them. And that's just poor internal change management, uh, but the hard work is still to build the capability to, use, to get the data, cross match it, clean it up, and then to superimpose that. One of the, the weaknesses we had in South Africa, for example, Almost 100% of our case selection was triggered by the submission of a return by a taxpayer, which means that the best way to stay out of our crosshairs is to not submit a return. And so we've had to broaden our risk profiling and case selection methodology to also suck into our risk engine other sources of data unrelated to a tax return and then do an internal check and have, have, for example, noticed people with high questionable economic activity locally and abroad are not even registered for tax. So if we're sitting here waiting for a declaration, we'll never know about them. So we've had to re-approach and reorient our methodology and approach to risk profiling and case selection to risk profile taxpayers, not risk profile returns. And the return is simply one input into the profiling of a taxpayer. So those are some of the internal challenges. And as I said, externally, I think most of my colleagues will uh, join with me in me to say that uh, revenue authorities are still struggling. That they are not sufficiently resourced. It's a, it's a function of austerity uh, globally, but I think smart governments 
you'd understand that revenue authorities are not cost centers, they're actually investment centers. Thank you so much um, for that. I, I could keep asking you questions, but I've got I've got other things <laughs> that I also need to get to. Um, okay, so our next panelist um, is um, also um, experienced um, with um, uh, how it, how to sort of tackle illicit financial flows with um, transparency. Um, Mr. Adam Elhiraika is director of uh, macroeconomics and governance division at the United uh, Nations uh, Economic Commission for Africa. Um, I, IFFs have been sort of damaging the effects of African countries to in, including in their growth of social economic development and weakening their governance and important uh, and importantly draining resources and tax revenue. Uh, Mr. Eliraika, um, what has been the progress uh, of African countries in addressing the recommendations of the high level uh, report on IFF uh, since 2015? Uh, good morning. Uh, many thanks, uh, Mr. Hamza. I would like to thank the Africa Tax Initiative for giving us in the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa the opportunity to participate in this panel. And uh, I would like to give you uh, greetings of my executive secretary, uh, Vera Songwe, who couldn't join us today. It, uh, I am really very happy to talk about this issue of uh, uh, illicit financial flows. We started difficult discussions about this back in 2010 during a joint meeting of African Union Commission and uh, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa uh, during annual conference in Malawi. Uh, since then, at that very difficult time, the discussion was very difficult, but I think we have come a long way uh, within Africa, within the United Nations and uh, international organizations. And uh, a lot has been done since then uh, to, uh, in response to the recommendations of the high level panel on illicit financial flows chaired by a former president of South Africa, Mr. Tabu Mbiki. Uh, but uh, equally many of the key policies remain underimplemented by most African countries. And we heard a lot today about the progress being made in some regards. But let me just mention a few uh, examples. Uh, according to our uh, uh, analysis, uh, Mozambique and South Africa have taken, for example, decisions to freeze or review double taxation agreements. Uh, Uganda has opened, uh, uh, has an open contracting data platform. Uh, seven juris jurisdictions have introduced legislation that requires the recording of beneficial ownership. And maybe some of you remember how difficult it was to talk about beneficial ownership uh, in Washington specific especially. Uh, these jurisdictions include Botswana, Egypt, Ghana, Kenya, Mauritius, the Seychelles, and Tunisia. And Ghana and Kenya launched online central beneficial ownership registries in 2020. Uh, however, a lot more is needed as only 21% 20, of African countries south of the Sahara we don't use the term sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, until we own our data, then we will be able to, to see Africa all the time. Uh, now ask countries to submit information on beneficial ownership. And most economies still do not require legal entities to disclose beneficial ownership information at all. So countries including Burkina Faso, South Africa and Uganda have brought in additional tax revenue uh, using information gained through exchange of tax information. We just heard uh, the commissioner from South Africa talking about how they benefited from EOIE. Uh, Mauritius, the Seychelles and South Africa are also making use of the automatic exchange of tax information. Mo Morocco is pursuing 
policies against drug trafficking. And a lot has been done actually uh, uh, in this regard, but a lot needs to be done. Hamza. Uh, do you want me to proceed no. with? <laughs> no, brilliant. No, thank you. Um, I, I guess my next question is um, the exchange of information uh, for uh, tax purposes has proven very effective in the fight against um, tax evasion and illicit financial flows. Uh, however, many African countries have yet to adopt the framework. Um, how should uh, we ensure that more African countries implement exchange of information? And what's the role of ECA, that the ECA can play uh, in this? Okay, uh, right, okay. Before uh, responding to this question, uh, uh, Hamza, I, uh, I would like to just uh, say a few things, a few words about what we are doing in ECA to support African countries in this journey. Uh, working, of course, with partners uh, uh, from the United Nations and beyond. So uh, in addition to following up, still following up on the recommendations of the high level panel, uh, working with uh, many institutions, including my friend on my left hand side, ATAF, and of course, uh, OECD uh, uh, and uh, many other institutions in the, in the continent. Uh, we continue to do research and to contribute to capacity building among African countries and uh, to help them uh, with institutional reforms needed. So we published a few reports, including our last economic, uh, economic governance report on institutional infra infrastructure for curbing illicit financial flows uh, from Africa. And uh, just tomorrow, we are organizing a meeting with uh, UNOCTAD and the UN Office for Drugs Control uh, on, uh, the on the uh, closing uh, of a program. We started uh, with 12 African countries to work on issues of uh, uh, fighting illicit uh, financial flows by organizing uh, a whole country approach, uh, working groups within countries to work together on this. So the 12 pilot countries uh, will share experiences uh, with the rest of Africa during this meeting. Uh, coming back to your question on uh, the issue of uh, uh, tax evasion, and in particular, uh, how countries can really make use of tax transparency and exchange of information uh, in fighting tax evasion and other forms of illicit financial flows. Uh, I, I would like here to really recognize the work that have the OECD and G20 uh, done uh, to, in this framework to address issues of tax cooperation and through the, the inclusive framework on PEPs and the Global Forum on Transparency and Exchange of Information for Tax Purposes. So the work you have been doing is really helpful in this direction. So exchange of information for tax purposes is important in our view because it helps countries, uh, especially uh, we have tax administrators here uh, who know this better than us. It helps uh, in, uh, uh, tax administrations to collect revenue from cross-border transactions and activities more effectively, and to narrow the uh, tax gap created by international tax evasion and avoidance, and to also help increase uh, corporate profits uh, by reducing profit shifting and hidden offshore wells. So uh, this, this can be very uh, helpful to countries as, as I said, uh, the tax administrations and commissioners here present know this better than us. Uh, and we have seen that uh, over the last few years in a number of African countries, uh, exchange of information and uh, tax transparency improved thanks to digitization. Actually, a few weeks back, uh, we brought a group of African countries here to Nairobi and uh, hosted to, to a meeting hosted by uh, Kenya Revenue Authority uh, to learn from Kenya's experience 
in uh, mobilizing excise duties. It was very impressive to see that while in many African countries, excise duty makes a small proportion of tax revenue. Here in Kenya, uh, excise duty makes about 2% of GDP. Uh, this is huge by African standards, very huge. And the countries really benefited, the countries we brought here uh, express their appreciation of what Kenya is doing and they are following up with us and we are working with them to benefit from this uh, Kenyan experience. So now, because of the progress we have seen in a number of African countries, we are trying to, to help African countries to benefit and to learn from each other, rather than going abroad uh, and look at experiences that can be very different in terms of context. Uh, so uh, we need to ensure that more African countries implement exchange of information for tax purposes and ECA uh, advocated the whole of government approach to addressing IFFs. As I said, the bringing different actors within countries to work together. Uh, and we are also uh, uh, advocating uh, that African countries should adopt a cost benefit analysis of companies when they give licenses to companies, they have to carry out cost benefit analysis of these companies are going to do and to make sure that the politicians companies uh, do not get contracts from government and there is sufficient information about these companies and also to strengthen public financial management and pursue international exchange of financial uh, information on country by country uh, basis. So there, uh, there are problems, of course, we have seen uh, 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 preventing some countries from making use of tax transparency and exchange of information. Uh, the Honorable uh, Commissioner from South Africa spoke about some of these issues. Uh, so we are uh, advocating uh, that uh, uh, where there are problems, African countries need to leverage pl the platform for collaboration on tax initiative for international cooperation, and also to make use of tax inspectors without borders. So uh, to close, uh, Mr. Chair, I think uh, to ensure better exchange of information, uh, Africa will require as I say, the whole of government approach, greater interagency collaboration, and better regional and international commitments to leverage information to fight uh, tax evasion and other forms of illicit financial flows. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Um And um, our next panelist um, is um, Mr. David Bradbury, uh, Head of Tax Policy and Statistics Division at the Center for Policy and Administration at the OECD. Um, tax policy statistics, the Tax Policy Statistics Division at the OECD um, is an interdisciplinary um, unit that includes economists, lawyers, statisticians, and policy analysts, and it focuses on providing sort of internationally uh, comparable revenue statistics. Um, one of the um, big things that they've done recently um, is publish a report assessing the tax compliance and, it, and illicit financial flows in South Africa. And it was a joint project between the OECD and uh, the National Treasury of South Africa. Um, Mr. Bradbury, can you um, walk us through um, uh, what was, um, sorry, <laughs> Uh, what, what what was what is the approach taken in the report to measure the scale of illicit financial flows in South Africa, and what are the main findings of the report? Well, thanks very much, Hamza, and thank you, Chair and uh, colleagues. It's great to be able to join you. Uh, I too uh, have the regret uh, that I'm not able to be there with you all in in person, but uh, I can see it's a very uh, lively and convivial event, and I wish you all the best for the proceedings. Uh, uh, as Hamza just indicated, uh, my team has been working uh, with the South African Treasury on a report to quantify the impact 
and the scale of illicit financial flows in South Africa. But there, of course, have been many reports done in the past using a whole range of different approaches. But one of the things that is unique to this particular report and this study is that the data that we have used is, is really something that has not been used before. And it is data that we have drawn from the CRS. So this is um, the common reporting standard, uh, automatic exchange of information related data is the basis of this study. And in addition to that, because we've been working with the South African Treasury, uh, they have been able to access uh, information. Uh, all of this, of course, is anonymized to protect the, uh, the individual taxpayers, but uh, the South African Treasury have been able to analyze in some detail the information that they've collected through their voluntary disclosure programs. And so when you put these two data sources together, the, the CRS, which really is a, a new and, and very rich source of data, and then you also have the information being collected from the voluntary disclosure programs, we're able to undertake a study like no other study that has really been undertaken before. Now, of course, like all studies, it has its limitations, but we think one of the advantages of this study is it gives us the ability to go to very granular micro data. Most of the studies in this area traditionally have involved macro data. So they're looking at big flows of trade and investment without necessarily understanding um, behind that data uh, what is involved. So we, we think that, and we hope that this contributes to the ongoing debate around illicit financial flows and brings a, a new and what we hope will be a, an approach and a methodology that will be adopted by others. Now, just quickly, what did we find in this study? Now, of course, uh, we know that uh, like many other countries, South Africa has been taking uh, many steps uh, to try and tackle illicit financial flows uh, and good progress is being made. But uh, what is clear is there, there is still more that can be done. Uh, and uh, we find that the scale of illicit financial flows in South Africa continues to be significant. In fact, our estimate is that each year, somewhere between, and I should emphasize, we're talking about cross-border flows here, cross-border uh, illicit financial flows. Uh, we estimate each year uh, that South Africa loses somewhere in the order of 3.5 to 5 billion US dollars worth of flows uh, as a result of, of illicit activity. Now, um, the, the way we calculate that is we, we actually start with the stock of offshore wealth uh, that we observe. And that's something that uh, we have estimated to be in the order of 40 to 54 billion US dollars. Uh, now, by matching uh, some of that information with information that has been collected through the voluntary disclosure pro programs, we've been able to, uh, to really refine those estimates and, and we think um, give them uh, a strong degree of, 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 of accuracy and robustness, notwithstanding uh, that like all studies, we do have to make some assumptions. Importantly, uh, a couple of things that we do. We, we define illicit financial flows to include uh, those flows of money that are illegal in origin, transfer, or use. So they're the three dimensions. Uh, but importantly, we identify um, those flows that are not declared to tax authorities as being illicit in nature. Now, um, that is not just to focus in on tax evasion. It goes much broader than that. And it goes much broader than that because typically other forms of illicit activities are not disclosed to tax authorities as well. So we do believe that we are capturing uh, illicit financial flows of a much broader nature. So things like drug money, bribes, uh, corruption related flows, uh, in addition to tax evasion. Uh, we think we also uh, will be capturing trade misinvoicing and, and, and various forms of money laundering. So uh, by and large, this is an approach that even though it focuses on tax data, it's, it's really agnostic about the type of flow. And, and we do think that we're capturing a whole range, uh, if not the complete gamut of the sort of, of, of illicit financial flows that countries are, are rightly concerned about. I should say that we do not seek to capture tax avoidance because we, we define tax avoidance as not being within uh, that basket of, of flows that are illicit financial flows. Now, this is an issue that there is some debate around internationally, uh, but 
Um, the, the flows that we concentrate on are those, as I said before, that are illegal in either origin, transfer or use. And as we know, as harmful as tax avoidance is, and at the OECD, for years we've been really um, working with countries to, to, to lead efforts to tackle tax avoidance. Um, the, the, the thing about tax avoidance is that it often, often involves uh, companies engaged in um, various activities that, strictly speaking, may fall within the terms of the law. So they're not illegal in that sense. They're still harmful and they should be tackled. Uh, and uh, we have certainly been involved in other projects where we sought to quantify the extent of tax avoidance uh, in, uh, in different studies. So all of that is to give you a little bit of a picture of what we found. Uh, we also were able to make a series of recommendations and, and work closely with South African authorities to identify areas where improvement can be made. And you know, there are many specific recommendations, but perhaps the, the big high level one that I would just emphasize is that government agencies have to be working together. Now it sounds obvious, not always easy to do in, in practice, uh, but there's all of this important information coming to, to, to tax administrations as a result of the CRS. Yes, that information has to be processed, applied and, and utilized, but it also has to be shared with other sources of information that other government agencies and departments are collecting. Because uh, the, the truth is that if you want to tackle illicit financial flows, government has to operate in that coordinated and cooperative way, or otherwise you just don't have a chance against uh, those that are engaged in, in, in shuffling money and shifting this money offshore for all manner of illegal purposes. And thank you for that. Um, are there, I guess, any lessons for uh, other African countries from what you guys learned in this report? Uh, is it replicable elsewhere? Yes, well, certainly there are a number of lessons. And I should say the first lesson is that um, the exchange of information works. And, and how do we find that? We find that in a number of ways. Firstly, when we look at the voluntary disclosure programs where um, individuals or, or um, people come forward and they disclose um, money that may be held offshore that they haven't previously told the tax authorities about. Um, what we noticed was immediately before the exchange of information, automatic exchange of information came into effect, there was this massive spike in the number of people that came forward and declared assets and wealth that had previously been uh, not declared. Uh, we also saw, um, and this is a, another interesting finding, that both at the moment when South Africa announced that it would enter into um, the automatic exchange of information, but then separately when it actually did finally implement in, because they're, they're two points in time. At both of those points in time, we saw um, the number of new filings, filings of, of new assets that were held offshore spike. So in both instances, we see that transparency, the automatic exchange of information, it sends a very clear message to people who have been uh, keeping their assets held offshore out of the view of the tax administration that we're about to shine a light on that. And people come forward, they declare those assets to pay more tax. And in voluntary disclosure programs, they also do the same thing. In terms of lessons for, for other countries, I think one of the key lessons is that um, you know, there is a lot to be said for um, using the data that you've got to better understand the nature of the problem. And, and this was an important thing that we achieved working with South Africa was we think we were able to, to get a much better understanding of the, of the problem. Now, you have a better chance of tackling the problem, I think, when you have that understanding of the problem. But indeed, through that process, we identified many areas where uh, additional work could be done uh, or better coordination with agencies could, could occur in order to ensure that a more timely response uh, could be brought to, to, into effect by the authorities. And of course, um, you, know, you need to, to, to act in a timely way uh, because uh, we know uh, how sophisticated some of the, uh, uh, the, the individuals and the, uh, and, and the various groups that are involved in organised crime uh, and other forms of illicit activity can be. So we think that uh, this particular study, because it allows you to get a really good picture of what's happening in your country, uh, 
that is a great lesson for other countries. We'd love to be able to work with other jurisdictions to be able to produce a similar study. And we hope that uh, these sorts of studies can also be carried out over time to assess the progress that is made uh, after various measures have been implemented. Brilliant, uh, really interesting. Um, and thank you for that, um, uh, David. Um, um, I'm gonna uh, move on to our next panelist, um, Mr. Logan Vaught, uh, who is the Executive Secretary uh, for uh, the African uh, Tax Administration Forum, ATAF. Um, I think he's uh, had a couple of shout outs already to <laughs> today. Um, so ATAF um, understands the need to promote tax transparency and EOI as a tool for enhancing domestic uh, resource mobilization in Africa and has been an, in the front line of building uh, effective tax administrations uh, to help them harness uh, the potential um, in their development in Africa. Um, my first question for you, uh, uh, Mr. Wart, is uh, what do African countries need to use, uh, what do African countries need uh, to be able to use tax transparency and EOI effectively as weapons to fight uh, uh, illicit financial flows in Africa? Thank you. Thank you very much, Hamza. Good afternoon, everybody. Firstly, thank you to Commissioner General Mburu for the great hospitality to KRA. And also, uh, allow me to acknowledge the chairperson of ATAF, Mr. Philip Chodi, who is the Director General of Office at Togolese de Reset. You know, a lot has been said about the, the benefits and the impact, and best illustrated by the last two presentations, amongst others. Uh, the presentation by South Africa illustrates very practically both the results and the impact and what is needed uh, to achieve the best out of the EOI transparency fight. So what I want to share is that firstly, a country needs to accept that engaging in exchange of information, automatic or on request, is beneficial. It yields the results and it is the key to dealing with illicit financial flow. There must be an acceptance of that. There are two areas that is, amongst others, I'd like to start off with what these countries need uh, to engage in, in, in beneficial, no, to engage um, in tax transparency and use EOI as a weapon. The first is legislation, and the second would be the treaty networks and getting the treaty networks in place. On legislation, a country needs to have the right legislation in place to allow exchanges to take place. Now in these presentations today, we've heard of different strategies countries have used, um, interagency cooperation, beneficial ownership, and then the exchange of information cross border. Now to allow a tax authority to have access to taxpayer information, there's the tax code, the tax act that allows for that. But to get information as Mr. Kisviter earlier spoke about, that is not in the filing, you need other sets of legislation. You need legislation that allows you access to the banking activities. You need legislation that allows you access to the trade activities, to the central bank transactions that goes through. And this information you do not get in a normal tax act. And so when we talk about the right legislation, we're talking about the gambit of legislation that is not limited only to what is in uh, the Income Tax Act. So we've got to get the right legislation in place for the EOI system to work and for inter-agency cooperation inside the jurisdiction to work. Of course, on the treaty networks, you need a good treaty network in order to exchange information with other countries. On the issue of uh, the right legislation, the legislation do not only deal with exchange of information legislation. I think Mr. Bradbury in his uh, exposition of, of the research into South Africa spoke about the various instruments they use to look at illicit financial flows and he defined it as those that are illicit. The biggest form of illicit financial flows in Africa actually happens through tax avoidance. And so that particular study would not have picked it up as you rightfully suggest. But there are legislat le legislative instruments that we need to deal with tax avoidance because it's actually a bigger form of loss than evasion itself. And for that, 
ATA, for example, have put together a guideline on transfer pricing legislation for African countries. We've put together a guideline on interest deductibility rules on thin capitalization. So those are other sets of rules to minimize the so-called legal ways in which people are reducing the revenue take of African jurisdictions. And that's an important part of that legislation. On the tax treaty networks, what's important, Africa has too few treaties, it has weak treaties, and I'm glad in the earlier presentation by uh, Dr. Alderica next to me, he spoke about some countries that are renegotiating those treaties. That's very important. What are the other elements? I think it's important to invest in infrastructure and information exchange. The type of infrastructure that allows, as Mr. Kisviter illustrated, you to say, if you receive 6 million pieces of data that allows you a 30 billion US dollar potential income, you need computers to process this. You need analysts to dissect the information. You need data security. For all of this, you need an investment. And people said here that we do not invest enough in tax administration. So an important part of this is to have competent authorities that are able to have trained people, but also to have especially information security and information technology infrastructure. Of course, we need policies. So let me quickly go on to say what other things are needed. We need the proper policies and we need capacity building. In capacity building, we're particularly looking at some of the issues raised earlier, but we need to train competent authorities. We need to train data analysts and we need tax inspectors that are able to use the information. In a lot of the audits, exchange of information data is not accessed or not even aware of. So there's a disjuncture as Mr. Kiswetter tried to illustrate earlier between the traditional audit and that which has become available over the last decade through these international cooperative instruments such as exchange of information. Of course, two important elements in conclusion of the section. Access to multinational enterprise information, access to commercial databases is important and it's incredibly expensive. ATAV has for the past four years purchased those licenses and, and through that purchase have allowed access to all our members to, to access those licenses and have been able to as part of our own 3 billion US dollar of tax, ta of tax money returned, have been using those databases in local jurisdictions in order to do that. So accessing that databases is important. A robust automation process within the automatic exchange of information, like some of the work in those countries that have automatic exchange of information, like the work we're starting to do, Commissioner General, Mburu here yeah, in, in, in KRA with you in preparation for automatic exchange of information. The final point I want to make, Amza, on this point is for me a very important point. A lot of the obstacles dealing with transparency and information exchange and the type of legislation that we need and the fact that we struggle to get this, I had a few conversations during coffee here, yeah. the struggle to get this legislation through parliament the struggle to get it through to the state law advisor, the struggle to get it through to the ministries. A lot of this probably can be circumvented if we try and deal with the issue of country by country reporting differently. And I want to suggest that a key policy consideration must be to allow for the local filing of MNE subsidiaries in that jurisdiction. For example, African countries have very limited EOI mechanisms and they have equally limited treaty networks. In some instances, some jurisdictions are not even party to the multilateral instrument that Grace was talking about. But even for those who have ratified the MEC, if dealing with a multinational enterprise, for example, from the US, this is an example, and noting that the US is a major economy and home to many multinational enterprises and ultimate parent entities, and that they operate or 
within African countries. And given the fact that in this example I'm making, the US is not part of the MAC, it means that countries won't be able to see the country by country report from the US. This is because the US has treaties only with four African countries. And so it's not obliged to send these reports to countries for whom it's not concluded these contracts. And that's very important. And as a result, there's a glaring gap as most African countries won't receive country by country reports from the bulk of MEs because the majority of them operate within the US in my example. And in reality, for this reason, we need to give consideration and the Africa initiative must take this as part of its agenda that local filing would address these gaps. That means a subsidiary should be required to file the country by country report in the jurisdiction where it files its tax return. And thus it addresses a lot of the EOI uh, requirements that we're trying to address in this meeting. So ATAV has been working on this. We've uh, got a working group on exchange of information and involved in the setting up of competent authority offices across the continent, 24 so far. And also um, we have a rapid response facility. It's a program that provides tax auditors across, uh, across the continent in an inter-African exchange program. And through this program, we've been able to engage in audits in a number of African countries up to now. So those are uh, the initial responses to your question, Hamza. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for that. Um, I guess like some of these, some of this you've already sort of touched on, um, but can you um, walk us through um, what you think the um, African initiative should focus on next? Well, I think in terms of what the African initiative should focus on next is um, in the tax, trans in the, in the tax uh, transparency report uh, that was uh, launched here today, there are a number of striking uh, uh, points in there. Uh, the limited amount of exchanges that has taken place, some of the infrastructure challenges. Um, and I think it's important that we try and address that in a very sort of operational way. We've seen part of that report has got a number of cooperating partners if you look at the back of that report. Uh, and we must get our partners involved because it's just, this is a very resource-rich resource uh, um, uh, uh, project and many countries on the continent. Um, as my colleague, Dr. Alderica says here, we're not talking about Sub-Saharan Africa, Africa south of the Sahara. Uh, um, there's a lot of resource constraints in setting up the technology, the training, uh, and so on. Um, and we should have the confidence to provide these resources to those countries. We should have the confidence to, 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 to provide those resources to the continent and then to facilitate the use of those resources. I think we need, uh, we need to do that. I think the Africa Initiative must take up the issue of localized C by, C, uh, country by country reporting that I have just many, mentioned. But importantly, we need to broaden the partners that we work with. ATAF works, for example, with a number of African partners in this. This includes the African Union, the African Development Bank, the UN Economic for Commission for Africa, and the Tax Justice Network. It's important to have those, those on-continent alliances. You have a different result. And with the Africa Initiative strengthening this, I think that we can even improve and enhance some of the good findings within the tax transparency report. But we must use the outcomes of that report. Globally, the work we do with the Global Forum, CREDAF, Qatar, and the West African Tax Administration Forum is important. So those workings, because all of these institutions I'm mentioning are working with the members around this table, the African countries around this table, and others who are not here uh, uh, in, in those jurisdictions. And we need to broaden this beyond who is doing what, but we need to broaden this and put in an evaluation and a monitoring mechanism that measures what we bring back, that measures what we have planted, and so that we can across organizations and in partnerships uh, work far more efficiently. Thank you. 
Brilliant. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm aware that we've sort of run over ever so slightly, um, but I wonder if we can have maybe one question from the audience. Uh, so this is a question for um, uh, Commissioner uh, Kiswetta. Um, can the Commissioner Kiswetta please offer his insights into whether South Africa is likely to renegotiate uh, double tax treaties between South Africa and other countries? Um, and I think that that must pertain to um, what uh, Mr. Walt was just sort of mentioning, um, that a lot of inter-African uh, tax treaties um, cause sort of an issue for tax transparency. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd actually just uh, typed a response to the question, but let me share the response publicly. The OECD model convention um, makes no proposal for withholding tax at all. Um, it simply allows for a rate to be negotiated between two countries. In the case of, of the, um, the specific question, um, with the, uh, with the um, uh, country involved, the DRC, <clears throat> the UN model uh, approach has been followed, which suggests a 10% withholding tax level uh, this has been the negotiating uh, agreement, negotiated agreement between the two countries and is therefore currently in practice. Okay, brilliant. Um, thanks uh, so much to uh, all of my panelists. Um, it's been fascinating hearing how African countries are sort of piercing the veil of secrecy. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, we can, you know, as African countries sort of say, uh, that we've uh, ended bank secrecy along with the rest of the world. <laughs>